Hey, what's up, everybody? Let me check to make sure everything is working today. Looks like it is. Cool. All right. So let's get going. Uh, so last week, um, I did this really long stream on Sunday, and I, I got into a lot of some of the issues that concern me about the topic. I'm always go going on about moral realism. And uh, I'm not sure if if I uh, have a whole lot more to add because I went for almost four hours last week. Um, and I feel like I got a lot of the things that have been on my mind off my chest. I do have quite a few other topics coming up. Um, so I have some stuff coming up on consciousness. I even have some stuff coming up on free will, which was actually the first video I did on this channel, which is almost eight months ago. Uh, so... Uh, You'll be seeing that stuff. Let me see what else I have going on for upcoming videos. Some of them I haven't posted yet. Ah, right. So a fun one that I'm going to cover is, um, so one of the things that I'm known for is the unintelligent, like as if people know about me. But if people do know about me, then they happen to know this is the most likely thing that they know about. You know, it's not like I'm a big YouTuber yet. Um, although the channel hit 675, so we're up. I mean, I remember when it just passed 500. And it passed 600, and now I'm approaching 700. So we're getting to that point where, you know, I think I'm going to cross a thousand people before the end of the year. Uh, so, and you could, you know, while I'm at it, you can contribute to that. So please subscribe if you haven't already. I do these live streams. I'm going to have interviews, uh, discussions, probably a few debates. There's going to be uh, quite a few things coming up. And um, so I got all that stuff going. Um, another thing that has been, it's been on the list, like the to-do list for a while, and I'm finally getting to the point where I'm like, okay, I have to sit down and do this, is to start just doing um, vi videos where it's just me, where it's just an audio recording. And I just go over some of the sort of key topics, ideas, and themes that I talk about. And at least one of those videos, I'm going to be covering the empirical research that I've done. Now, I know I've brought this up, I mentioned it in passing, but I haven't really done a deep dive into the empirical research that I do. So uh, for those of you that are familiar with my work and what I do, uh, I have a background in philosophy and psychology. And at this point, I have more of a training and background in psychology than philosophy, even though I'm always talking about philosophy. And a big part of that research, my, my PhD was in psychology, but I specialize specifically in the psychology of metaethics, and in particular in this question of whether non-philosophers, you know, people without, a, you know, a bunch of training in philosophy, um, you know, basically like there's various terms people use: folk, ordinary people, lay people, just people that are not really doing philosophy or thinking a whole lot about philosophy. The question that some of this research is directed at is whether or not those people are moral realists or not, and I argue that the answer is. Um, not, but in an interesting way. I don't think that people are anti-realists. I think that they don't have any particular view at all. Now, that is not the reading that I've seen anybody take away from the empirical literature itself. There is a paperback from 2009 by a philosopher named Michael Gill, who positions the proposal of meta-ethical folk indeterminacy as a view that exists against the backdrop of a particular historical a, a, a historical series of events within analytic philosophy. So you have this Anglophone tradition, you have this, it's a particular development within Western philosophy, predominantly um, that emerged in the United States, the UK, and the Anglophone world more generally, so like Canada, New Zealand, Australia. And this, much of this work focuses on um, cl uh, verbal clarity, precision, rigor, um, it, a, a big focus on semantic analysis and language. Uh, and that particular movement uh, over the past 120 years or so, I guess you could say since around G.E. Moore, you had non-naturalist realism step onto the stage in a sort of modern form. And you had this big focus throughout the 20th century on the, the semantic analysis of what you could call ordinary moral claims. So that sort of 20th century approach to metaethics centered on basically taking sentences like murder is wrong and then saying, okay, what are these competing theories that center on the semantic analysis of those claims. And what you'll find, what Gill points out, is that these disputes, we haven't resolved them. Now, one possibility is we haven't resolved them because we haven't even been really doing this, like this really heavy focus on analyzing moral claims for very long. It's been maybe really heavy duty for 
70, 80 years, like it's not super duper long. It's only a few generations of people. So maybe we just haven't cracked the code yet and figured it out. I think that that's a possibility. Now, I don't, I don't find it to be the most plausible possibility, but it, let's leave open that it's a possibility. Uh, so maybe we just need a bit more time and we'll eventually figure it out. But if you look at the nature of these disputes, you see that both the realists and the anti-realists in their efforts to capture ordinary moral semantics can make some pretty compelling points. I think a lot of people would say that non-cognitivists maybe don't make quite so compelling a point. I think people are underestimating the resources available to non-cognitivists. Often a lot of what you'll find in internet discussions and like intro to philosophy and intro to ethics courses is a, a an emphasis on like uh, A.J. Ayer and R.M. Hare. So some of the early non-cognitivists and there's often very little discussion of contemporary expressivist accounts. Now, I think there's probably a couple reasons for this. Uh, actually, there's several. Here's some speculation. One, uh, hair and, and air are just easier to cover. Two, it's just inertia. People haven't updated uh, their accounts, uh, like the, the textbooks and all the way this is taught, the way this is discussed, to really address the more contemporary forms. Three, the more contemporary forms are kind of complicated. They get into like deflationary views of truth, and they get into some really much more sophisticated approaches to language and metaphysics and, and all these really deep questions. And they're trying to balance a lot at once philosophically. They're not just, hey, murder is wrong actually just means murder boo. Um, they're more sophisticated. Now, that isn't to say that the early, like, hair, hair doesn't have anything to say to uh, people that bring up the embedding problem or other sorts of objections to non-cognitivism. I think these older accounts, people undervalue what they're actually capable of doing in responding to these sorts of objections. Now, they may tie their own hands down by wetting themselves too much to contemporary philosophical methodology, but they don't have to. And these positions can break free from the sort of self-imposed methodological shackles that anti-realist position, anti-realists often sort of confine themselves to. I mean, this is exactly what I do, is I just break out of what I take to be false dichotomies, false distinctions, and bad methods in the first place. And I think that non-cognitivists have the ability, the resources, and it, like they just can do that if they're so inclined. If not, then you could have a lot of these sort of flat-footed, you could call them sort of primitive or early versions of non-cognitivism that are not particularly defensible. You could just, you know, hey, you have this embedding problem. They don't seem capable of handling it. So they're they're done with. But the, the more contemporary accounts do have ways, or at least they purport to have ways of circumventing those problems. Now, the issue is, uh, it looks like the literature, like not that like the, the journal articles, but like textbooks and the sort of standard way this is taught doesn't seem to have caught up with it. I still see the classical non-cognitivist accounts, and typically you'll see emotivism in particular, and sometimes you'll see some type of universal prescriptivism. Um, but you will rarely see, uh, but this is probably starting to change. I don't know. I haven't been teaching intro to ethics courses. Uh, I taught intro to, to philosophy, what, I don't know, like 10 years ago or something. So I don't know. And I have one person at one place. So it's certainly possible some instructors have started to incorporate a newer material, but it hasn't been my experience and it hasn't been what I've heard. And I do occasionally see syllabi and I don't see this stuff on the syllabi. Now, so it, like inertia and the other stuff is easier. So it's easier to teach it to undergrads uh, if it's simple and straightforward and people haven't caught up. Um, the other stuff comparatively is much more complicated and difficult to teach is often would be so difficult to teach. It might not even be appropriate for an intro course, but I think it could be done. Uh, the thing is, I think it'd be pretty difficult to do it. Uh, a lot of these accounts are sufficiently weird that it would be hard to explain them. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do a good job without a bit of prep work. Like I'd have to refresh and reread and, and go over some things and take notes and then say, okay, well, here's what they seem to be saying. And, uh, like it's kind of difficult to do. So that's part of the reason um, is just that it's actually difficult to to get to like present quasi realism in this sort of thing. Do, doesn't mean people haven't. I think Kane B has a video on quasi realism. Check that out. I'm sure it's awesome. Kane B, by the way, also has a new video on the arbitrariness challenge for moral realism. I listened to that this morning. I thought it was excellent. I start. I jumped into the comments there, uh, and so there's a lively discussion going on there right now. Uh, but another reason that people don't engage with these contemporary expressivist accounts. Well, actually, there's so many reasons. I, I don't know, I just felt like speculating about this, so why not? Uh, another reason is just those accounts actually can respond to these objections. And I think a lot of critics of anti-realist positions want easy targets. And so they just knock down easy targets. Now, they're not knocking down straw men because the, the positions that they're going after, emotivism, um, prescriptivism, that sort of thing, 
they're actually positions that people have endorsed and articulated and talked about. Uh, that does, like it, it, it's like if there was like some like, imagine if if uh, critiques of theism only targeted the theological work of people that wrote theology in the 17 and 1800s. And there's been all this work. I'm sure there's been tons of work in the in the 1900s and more recent in the past 20, 30 years. And the people just didn't talk about it at all. You start to think, huh, maybe they're not going after better stuff. Like maybe the new stuff, they're not going after it because it's harder to go after. And it's not just that it's more complicated, but that it's not as easy to critique. Maybe it actually addresses their concerns, you know? So I think part of it is just, why not just say non-cognitivism is these stupid old theories that are easy to refute. Hey, look how stupid and easy to refute they are. So non-cognitivism is, is wrong, moving on. And I think even professional philosophers do this. Um, now, in their defense, it could be that to the extent that these these more contemporary like hybrid accounts and and like you could say like contemporary expressive and neo-expressivist accounts to the extent that they address those concerns maybe they address them in ways where their critics are like okay fine you've addressed it but also you've closed the gap enough where it's not even clear to me that how far your view is from my own uh and if that's the case then a lot of the realist and anti-realist positions are finding this sort of murky territory where they don't really hate each other so much they're not so diametrically opposed they just have sort of um denominational differences that are maybe not so stark as to prompt revulsion. Uh, I don't know how much philosophy is driven by revulsion, but um, I, that's for me, that's part of why I don't like them. I think that they are, a lot of these accounts are too conciliatory and they are, oh, well, we have to capture the realist appearances of morality. Screw that. I don't even think it has realist appearances. I don't have realist appearances. So if some people report those, okay, who, how many, why? I think there's psychological work to do here and descriptive work to do here to figure out who has which phenomenology, what psychological processes are involved in the production of that phenomenology. How do we explain that? Can we explain it without, you know, like there's a bunch of questions asked here. And also keep in mind, virtually all of this work is done specifically as the semantic analysis of English sentences. And, you know, you will probably get a little bit of discussion in other languages, but they're typically going to be languages where there's it's like people that are doing Western philosophy or Western influence philosophy in those like maybe German or something like that. Uh, but you're not going to get this cross-cultural, highly open-ended research into the nature of moral talk, everyday moral talk, that is sensitive to linguistic variation and cultural variation in a way that isn't only focusing on languages that happen to be within the orbit of and heavily influenced by precisely this type of philosophical reasoning that, that is then in turn carried out by people with a very heavy influence of Western philosophical training frequently in English. And so you do get this cultural and you could say sociolinguistic or cultural linguistic problem where almost all of the focus to the extent that it even span, spreads out from English is going to be narrowly confined to languages that are handled in a way by people that are potentially carrying on board, like if there are biases uh, or, or a narrow uh, blanket perspective with respect to the analysis of English sentences, this could easily get imported, you know, and brought into analysis in other sort of peripheral languages of the people engaged in these academic disciplines. It's, it's not like we're picking a, a, a cultural, a culture or a language or a perspective at random or finding one that might be uh, in, a, in a, some principled way, plausibly different from how people might think and speak in Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic populations, and specifically like the UK or the US, uh, and then going there and, and doing, you know, with cross-cultural, like like cultural psychology, anthropological research, uh, historical analysis of the, the development of the language, was the language different before, you know, various types of cultural influences from, from out, uh, you know, from the, from other places in the world. That's not really being done. And so you still have this major, potentially highly culturally narrow perspective. Anyway, um, Gill, in that paper, I'm pivoting all the way back to where, I'm like reeling it back to where I was at. Gill suggests, hey, maybe the reason all of these disputes seem intractable and realists and anti-realists seem to make these good points is because um, either it's possible that the way that people use moral claims varies from one situation to another or from person to person. And so there's not a consistent, rigid, fixed semantic analysis to have in the first place. It could be that sometimes moral claims are used to express um, like people's just their emotional states or to express them to issue imperatives. Sometimes they're used to state facts about what's true or false relative to the standards of the speaker or the speaker's culture. Sometimes they're used 
in an attempt to describe stance independent moral facts. And so really we have this semantic pluralism and we're not gonna resolve like what the correct singular analysis is that Gill calls it the uniformity assumption because there isn't a uniform analysis to have. It would be like someone saying, what type of fruit are fruits? Like, are they bananas or are they apples or are they pears or are they oranges? That's a ridiculous question because you could go out and find apples and bananas and pears and oranges. And so as if there's only one type of fruit, all the fruits are, is the question itself is ill-posed. And it could be that the way that, that moral language functions is it just isn't used in a semantically uniform way. That's one proposal. The other proposal is that there is no determinate account of ordinary moral semantics at all because ordinary moral language just isn't in the business of expressing or stating or, or issuing claims that comport more like better with one of these accounts than another. Now, Gill, I don't think is super clear in that paper, uh, but uh, Walterson and Armstrong in a response, uh, it's, a, it's a great paper, it's called Mixed Up Metaethics, lays out a bunch of these issue, issues and also actually digs in to the 20th century metaethics literature and finds quotes from philosophers that make it very clear because you know sometimes people say, wait, well, they're not really trying to describe ordinary language. They're very explicit. They will say things like the ordinary speaker, when they use a moral claim, intends to mean this. And then that is then leveraged into the metaethical accounts that they go on to describe, whether it be emotivism or error theory or whatever. Uh, so when people say that, it's really weird. Like you could just find the quotes and show that people uh, are saying these things. I have had some people look at those quotes and say they don't mean that. Okay, uh, maybe they don't mean what it, to me it looks like they're saying. Like if someone says, my account is giving you an account of what the ordinary speaker intends to communicate when they use language. And you're saying, yeah, they're not talking about what ordinary people intend to communicate when they use language. Okay, I don't know what to tell you at that point, uh, <laughs> but you do get that. So the other possibility, uh, well, sorry, what Senator Armstrong points out is this distinction between these sort of accounts that are trying to capture the psychological reality, like what people are committed to, and then a sort of external, non-necessarily, it's not even attempting to capture the psychological states, but it's a sort of externally adequate description. I don't even quite know what exactly that would amount to or what that would mean. I don't know how you could have this psychologically empty account of language. To me, that's nonsensical, but uh, apparently some people think you could have that. And I don't know if Gil has both in mind or just one of them. Uh, I favor indeterminacy about both. And so indeterminacy about the language itself would mean something like this. If you looked at, you could we could call them linguistic outputs. So you just have the sort of raw data of things people say, right? You go out and you, you have tape recorders, you look at transcripts of things people write down, and you look at all that data. And you're trying to say, okay, let's make sense of this. Let's make sense of what people are doing with this language. That you can make equally good sense or, or so, we, uh, it, like approximately equally good sense on an anti-realist account or a realist account. Now, it could be because both describe it equally well or because both describe the language equally poorly. But as long as there's no decisive winner, as long as you could say, in a certain sense, it's underdetermined by the available data, then we wouldn't be able to decisively say whether uh, a realist or an anti-realist account of any particular kind offers a better descriptive account of linguistic output of ordinary moral claims. So that's one element of indeterminacy. I call this uh, indeterminacy with respect to meta-ethical commitments. And then the other type of, of indeterminacy would be with respect to the psychological states. Now this one's more straightforward. It could just be that when people are making these claims that there's there are no mental states involved. Like they don't believe that they're expressing just an emotion or an imperative. They don't believe that there are stance independent moral facts. Um, and they're not, they're not like trying to express that when they say these sorts of things. In fact, they don't they might not even have to believe it. They could just, everyone is lying and they're all trying to get other people to believe that uh, morality is, is, a, you know, stance independent, but they don't actually believe it, but they would still use the language in, in that way. And then it would, you would, I mean, that would make things real complicated, but the, the, just the point is if we're going to try to capture the psychological states themselves, it could be that people just don't have any particular commitment one way or another. Um, you, get, you know, the example I give is quantum mechanics example. If a person says, I think it's going to rain tomorrow, they don't have to have a Copenhagen or, or, or Bohm or, or many rules interpretation of quantum mechanics. The example that Gill gives in the paper, and many of you have heard this already, is uh, mathematical Platonism. So if someone say, you know, kids in a class and they're like two plus two equals four, they don't have to be a Platonist or an anti-Platonist about mathematics. You don't need either of those. And when, every, when people in everyday life are like cashing their paycheck and they're, you know, they're, you're typing in like, um, $112. You don't have to think that there are these like necessarily existing platonic forms that correspond to the languages. Like that's, you don't have to think that. 
I don't ha also have to think that that's not the case either. You don't have to think anything about that. That's just not what you're doing. Um, and so Gill suggests that more language may be used that way. Now, that paper came out in 2009. There had already been a few papers out. So Goodwin and Darley have the most important paper on this, um, it, important sort of historically in terms of getting the ball rolling in this research. That was 2008. I think it might be mentioned. I don't know which papers were mentioned in the, the footnotes, but Gill seems to think that the empirical literature is relevant. And so Gill at least seems to regard these as empirical questions. And then so do I. And so you can kind of have this conditional thing. Like, look, if claims about the meaning of ordinary moral claims are, the, are not empirical claims, like they're not claims about the psychological states of speakers or some other type of empirical claim, I, I don't know what kind of claims they are. Like, are these analytic claims? And then we're supposed to engage the correct account of what a moral claim is. Uh, and so like, could just be that a moral claim just is a claim about what stands independently true. I don't know how to address, I don't even, is there a fact of the matter about that? Because to me, these strike me largely as matters of stipulation. You could just say by moral claim, I mean a reference to stand, because let's just say you stipulate that by a moral claim, you mean a claim about what is stance independently right or wrong. And then empirically, we go and we, we test how people use language and nobody thinks that way and nobody uses language that way. Okay, so then nobody makes moral claims. So then you go find a person and they say murder is wrong. And then another person goes, I disagree with you. I think murder is sometimes acceptable under these circumstances. And the other person goes, ah, but have you considered this normative principle? And the other person goes, huh, okay. None of that is moral language, if that's the case. Because they're not talking about what stands independently right or wrong. Let's say they were relativists or they're indeter it's indeterminate. Um, then that's not moral language. Okay, so if you're going to stick to these these analytic accounts, then you're st there's still going to be the empirical question of whether, as a matter of fact, anybody uses moral language. You could get all this like superficially like see apparent moral language, but if they're not using it that way, then they're not they're not engaged in moral discourse. Um, or if you just say nope, they're engaged in moral discourse whether they intend to be or not. So when people say murder is wrong, the statement murder is wrong means that it stands independently wrong, even if the speaker doesn't intend to communicate that. And even if the person interpreting them doesn't interpret it that way. So it means that independent of what anybody's actually trying to do or what they take themselves to be doing. That, you could think that, I mean, it's possible to think that, that strikes me as absurd and very silly. And so I think empirical questions are gonna have to step in to the picture here somewhere. Anyway, um, I don't even remember what I was originally talking about, but that's, that's kind of what I, oh, right. I was talking about how I'm gonna be talking more about this research. So. My account of the empirical data is that indeterminacy is probably the most plausible account. Now, I should qualify that by saying, I think indeterminacy is the most plausible account, but I don't think everyone everywhere in all cir circumstances has no determinate meta-ethical standards. Obviously, some people that are not professional philosophers have picked up a book on meta-ethics, so they've started reading the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and they've read about cognitivism and non-cognitivism, and they're like, huh, I think cognitivism is correct. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, well, now that person maybe... Have, they have a they endorse cognitivism, so they have a metaethical stance now. Um, maybe that doesn't change how they speak, uh, so it wouldn't influence their commitments. It's possible some people have commitments. I just don't, you know. It's same thing with the quantum mechanics. Some people have picked up pop science books. They read them. They adopt a view. Uh, but, but this this gets complicated. Like how much flat? Like to the extent that the person that picks up a random book on metaethics or starts reading the SEP really understands what they're reading to what extent are they with respect to that issue an ordinary person anymore like if if you know i don't have any formal training in physics uh like you know beyond like basic coursework yeah and i'm not, I'm not like a phd in physics but if i start doing a bunch of physics stuff like i buy textbooks i buy technical works i start reading journal articles and i just i'm an autodidact and i work at home for like 10 years on physics and i get you know i work up all the math skills to really start trying to understand the equations that go into quantum mechanics and then I form a view of like, oh yeah, the many worlds view, this seems right to me. Am I, am I a non-specialist anymore? I mean, it would be weird to treat a person that went through that, all that effort as closer to a lay person, like a non-physicist as a physicist, because at that point I might have as comprehensive an understanding and have done like the only difference is like, I don't have a, like a diploma saying I studied physics, but I might've studied as, as much or more physics as like a person with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. So why would I why would I count as a layperson anymore? So you get this kind of problem where, to the extent that people have to do the relevant work to comprehensively understand the issue in a way where, like, the more basically the more you understand the issue, the less you're a non a non philosopher. And so, it, I, my view is basically that that problem 
is such a significant problem for metaethics that it's not clear to me that unless you could show that people have inchoate metaethical stances or commitments without formal training, um, I think the most plausible explanation of the of the available empir empirical literature is that they don't have views on these these um, positions. They don't have commitments on these positions. There's no need to posit realism or anti-realism to make sense of ordinary moral language. And um, there's no psycholo like there's no compelling psychological data that people decisively favor realism or anti-realism. A lot of the uh, so what I want to get into when I do videos on this is to explore some of the, the sort of major works. And I want to do more of a deep dive and get into more detail about specific papers. So I want to go through the Goodwin and Darley paper. I want to go through the alternative paradigms. Now, part of the reason I'm mentioning this is because I did two recent interviews. I posted both of them in the community section. Um, for people in the chat, I didn't even say hi to people in the chat. I've been going at this for almost a half hour. Um, well, I should just say hi, first of all. And then second, do you see the stuff in community? I, I do a lot of polls in there. I haven't done as many for a while. I was doing them like every week. Uh, but I did post both of those in there. I saw one of them only got one like, so I'm going to post it here in the chat. But I, I listened to this, and I don't know if they did some sound quality was better than normal. Um, it's probably because um, it wasn't it wasn't recorded, so I had the microphone actually close to my face, like it's supposed to be. Um, so there, I posted it there. There's the link. That's not helpful. Let me pin it. Do, 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 do. So my microphone is actually blocking. That's why I'm turning my head. If you're like, what is Why are you turning your head that way? Okay, so I pinned that. Check that out because I thought that went pretty well. And what I do in that and the interview on Majesty of Reason, both of them are good for different reasons. At least I think they're good. Um, is uh, I cover some of this research, but the, and actually in this case, I was covering most of my research. I didn't get into this other research. So what I'd like to do is cover the existing empirical research and go into, um, you know, maybe do a video on the disagreement paradigm and then a video on the, meta, the various meta-ethics scales. So there's the new meta-ethics questionnaire. There's the moral relativism scale. Uh, there's a few other scales. Some of them have only been used in one paper and haven't been reused outside of that. But the moral relativism scale is pretty cool because it's a pretty comprehensive scale development paper that they, they put a lot of work into devising a, a, a more robust scale. It focuses specifically on measuring moral relativism, which is interesting, uh, but there are other scales that look at a broader range of meta-ethical categories and distinctions. So I wanna get into that research. And what I wanna get into that research, that, like the purpose of that is to show you, there's there's now, like when I started this, it was 2012, uh, there wasn't that much research. And if you look at like by the years, um, the, the papers that have come out, like you'll see in those years, you would get five papers. And then these years, you're getting many more papers than that. And very quickly, it wasn't just myself, but other people in the field, James Beebe, um, uh, Jennifer Wright, uh, and uh, Thomas Pulzer. Uh, they have all noticed that there are methodological concerns in the empirical literature, and they have worked to identify and respond to and divide and like improve the existing paradigms or propose new paradigms or, or new measures and that sort of thing to circumvent or mitigate some of the methodological problems. So something that really I like about this literature is that from very early on, people were, um, besides just me, and this is part of what motivated me and encouraged me to like, be, oh, wow, other people are working on this. Like it, it got me interested in these methodological questions. So the purpose of going through this empirical literature is not just to, to tell you, hey, hey, here's why the empirical literature is wrong. The thing with a lot of these studies is that the original intent behind the paradigms is great. Uh, many of the studies are actually quite well designed relative to paradigms outside the field. Uh, third, the questions that we're trying to, to ask with a lot of these paradigms are much more difficult than it is to like, ask people if they like pizza or something. Um, and so when I critique these measures, it's not because I think that this is bad research. It's because these questions are really, really hard. And in showing you the methodological limitations of some of these early studies, what I want to show is that this is the kind of, it, it's not so easy to find out if people are realists or anti-realists. And one of the things I find immensely frustrating about discussions about this topic is that people will report anecdotes. Well, most of my friends are realists. It seems to me that everyone's a realist. If psychological questions were that easy to answer, we wouldn't need to be doing experimental psychology. And already we know 
uh, most studies in psychology don't appear to replicate. And uh, this would almost certainly apply to uh, broad areas of research in the vicinity of, of what I do. Um, you know, it's, it certainly applies to social psychology more broadly. Now, there was a replication project for experimental philosophy and it had a better replication rate. Um, but, you know, I, I'm i still, I mean, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't 95% replicated. Um, so, I, in fact, I think there was one of the Folkman ethics papers in there and it did replicate. So, it used, I think it used the disagreement paradigm, one particular version of it. I think it was a, a, a Likert scale version and not a categorical multiple choice version. Um, I think it was the folk more relativist paper. I'd have to check. I think that's the one that they replicated. And I think it replicated just fine. Like it wasn't like on the fence or with a really minimal, like really tiny effect size or something like that. I think it did just fine. Uh, but you know, that's one replication. There's not a lot of replications in this area. So I'd like to see what happens if there's more replication research. Anyway, just the point is, it has been incredibly difficult just to construct well-designed, replicable, high-quality psychological research that gives you good a good quantitative analysis of, for instance, the U.S. population. Even you, even with people specially trained to do this, it's still hard to make solid inferences about the about the uh, you know the size of a particular effect, whether or not there is a particular effect, where this effect occurs, the circumstances in which it occurs. The questions in psychology uh, that people, I think, people outside of psychology, they often think uh, that it's easy to address these questions anecdotally or from the armchair or just by going on your experiences. It is not easy, and, and like the empirical tools available to us. Uh, so this idea that people could just say, yeah, I, most of my friends are realists, it's really plausible to me that people are realists. I think this is based on, um, it it's fails to appreciate how difficult it is to actually answer questions and to actually get good data on, on this sort of thing. Um, you know, you could, just anecdotes for psychological questions are just not very good. And this isn't even getting into how culturally and linguistically um, narrow a lot of people's personal experiences are going to be. Uh, a lot of people are only going to speak, I mean, most, most people aren't speaking all 6,000, whatever, 7,000 languages there are in the world. And, you know, look, if you spoke a thousand and you talked to uh, hundreds of people in a thousand languages and they all sounded like moral realists to you, fine. Nobody has ever done that. That's not what people's experiences are like. People's experiences are giving them this sliver within a sliver within a sliver of the human experience. And for them to extrapolate from that, when we reliably feel like, my point here is, whatever your unsystematically gathered questionable memories of your personal experiences through self-selected, you know, not randomly assigned, um, uh, you know, people that you've interacted with using non-systematic methods that were not specifically designed to solicit their actual metaethical views, using all that, you think that the people you spoke to or interacted with were realists or were anti-realists, you're going to generalize from those experiences to everyone in the world when we we know that if I surveyed a thousand people in the US, that wouldn't be good enough to generalize to people in the world, but your personal experiences are somehow good enough. It's, uh, there's not a, like, it's not reasonable. It's, it's not, that's not the reality of how psychology is. Even if I surveyed a thousand people in the U.S., that's not going to tell me how people around the world think in general. It's not generalizable. And that's because we now know that people in the United States psychologically differ in systematic, reliable, detectable ways from people from outside the United States. We already know this. So why would your experiences in Utah or Florida or wherever tell you about people all over the world? It's just, but pe maybe people don't, you know, people don't know this. Um, and so I, I, what I want to do in getting into this literature is to show, look, these are tough questions and just relying on anecdotes is not going to cut it. It's just not, it's not even close to cutting it. Like it's not even one, you know, I want to say a thousandth, maybe it's more than a thousand, but it's less than a hundredth of the way to get into the answers here. Uh, in doing this, I also want to show this, this research is pretty cool. It's, it's interesting research is, you know, at least I think it is. And I think it's undervalued. There's not a lot of people doing this research. And I think by digging into this research, you could learn a lot that could be, um, transported over to other areas of psychological research because of this focus on methodology. So I want to talk about the Goodwin and Darley stuff, the disagreement paradigm, the different meta-ethics skills, and a variety of newer paradigms. So there's this really cool one that takes these three thought experiments from Enoch, that uh, Enoch's a moral realist, that's supposed to show you that people are sort of implicitly, intuitively disposed towards realism. It's, it's a cool paper. 
uh, I do critique it. I critique it, you know, I, I don't think that the paper supports the conclusion that most people are realists, even though the author argues that it does, but it's a cool paper. Um, and it's, it's worth having a look at. So I wanna get into all that stuff so you could see, um, start to see where I'm coming from when I say that I don't think that people have determinate views. Now, part of the reason why has to do with my, my research, which is a sort of response to that literature. And what I do is I engage in some quantitative and some qualitative, it's, I use both, to assess how participants interpret those questions. And what I find is that the participants do not interpret those questions in the way that the, the people that design those questions intended for them to interpret them. They don't typically interpret questions about moral realism and anti-realism to be questions about moral realism and anti-realism. Um, and if that's the case, then the measures are not valid. And if you have a large portion of your sample doesn't interpret the question the way you intended, you don't now, whatever variation you get, you don't know whether it can be attributed to differences in their interpretations or, or differences in the actual measures that you're intending to measure. It'd be like if you were trying to average out a thousand thermometers, but we discover like 60% of the thermometers are inaccurate and we don't know which 60%, something like that. Like, what are you going to do? Like average out, you, you, the, none of the data is good if a lot of it isn't good enough. Now, if you could isolate subsets of the data, that would be one thing. And to a certain extent, you could. It's not like I, I know 60% of participants didn't interpret the studies as intended, and then I don't know which 60%. I could tell you, I think these ones didn't interpret it as intended, and I think these ones did. And then there's a big chunk of that I'm not sure about, and it's not really possible to tell from a very limited slice of like a two-sentence response. It, you, a lot of times you can't judge. Like, did they? is it clear that they didn't interpret it as intended? No, you don't know. Um, so a lot of times... The best answer is, I don't know, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Uh, and that's actually probably the majority of participants in, in many of the measures. Anyway, um, if if you have this large portion that didn't interpret it as intended, and you want to say, okay, well, let's just analyze the data and remove all of them, um, you're going to have other empirical problems. Uh, so one of these problems is that you could end up getting a bias towards people and the concepts as intended than people that don't. And now what is your sample? Because what if, I mean, if your goal is to study how non-philosophers think about these things, and a lot of non-philosophers reliably interpret questions about metaethics in non-metaethical terms or in the, the unintended metaethical distinctions, like, and you're gonna say, okay, well, if you don't interpret it the way I intended, then I'm gonna rule you out. Then you're stacking the deck against a thesis like mine, indeterminacy, because you're just going to say, if the person appears to give an answer that would support indeterminacy, then they don't count as a participant. Okay, so you're going to rule out everybody that would support my conclusion based on what principle? Like, wh what's the idea there? Uh, it, you know, there would have to be a principled reason for ruling them out. And they didn't interpret it as intended. Doesn't, like, there's a question of, well, why didn't they interpret it as intended? Okay, let me get into the chat and start saying hi to people. I went for a solid 40 minutes just off, uh, you know, just improvising. So let's see. Um, so this is from way back. From Tails saying hello, hi to you. I got Jonathan Becker saying yo, hi to you. All right, um, I don't know what that means. Oh, <laughs> I guess because of the title, Biting Bullets. Oh, right, I should get into the, the title uh, for today. Um, let me get through the chat, and then I forgot to let people uh, know that I was here, that should know that I'm here, so give me a moment. One second. Okay. Um, all right. So Jonathan Becker says, I don't hate the bullet biting language, but I do hate the implication from some that I have to keep biting bullets. Like I start each conversation about realism by taking damage, anti-realism debuff. Debuff. Yeah. <laughs> this is me thinking, um, well, I'm not going to get into that just yet, but yeah, debuff is like video game language. Okay. So lots of jokes about the title, um, which I will get into today. Sandels says, if anti-realism doesn't require bitering licorice bullets, I don't want to be an anti-realist. So I take it you, so I like licorice. I think it's a sort of thing. Whatever happened to licorice? I never hear about it anymore. Like when I was growing up, people talked about it like a, like a, like butterscotch. Whatever happened to butterscotch? It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we've got Ben Cooper that says, hi. Alonzo Fife says, hello. Logo Sarsgaard says, hello, Lance. Hi. All right, so Banner says, 
how can you safely say anti-realism involves no bullets being, I think you mean bit, uh, being no bullets being bit, but whenever you bite the bullet of epistemic normative anti-realism with respect to companions and guilt. Okay, so um, first, a moral anti-realist isn't necessarily going to bite the bullet on epistemic anti-realism insofar as that would be called, considered biting the bullet. I don't even like framing it that way. That was part of the, the point behind this title, which I, I'll, I'll talk about after I get through the chat. And uh, give me one second to check a couple other things. Okay. In fact, let me, I, I forgot to let people know that I am here. So give me one moment. I'm going to do that now. Do, oh, right. Okay, done. All right. So uh, a moral anti-realist that uh, is responding to Companions of Guilt. In fact, let me take a step back so people that aren't familiar with Companions of Guilt know what Companions of Guilt is about. So Companions of Guilt arguments are supposed to show that if you want, so that whatever reasons you have for rejecting moral realism, that you would have similar reasons for rejecting epistemic realism, and you don't want to reject epistemic realism, so you shouldn't, to be consistent, reject moral realism. And the idea behind, I mean, there's a few ideas you could run with behind that. I mean, one is just getting a person to be consistent with their own principles. So if a person thinks, here's a reason why I don't accept moral realism, maybe it's like Mackey's argument for queerness or whatever, um, if the, a similar rationale on your own view would also apply to epistemic uh, normativity, like stance independent epistemic norms, then to be consistent, you would have to be an anti-realist about epistemic normativity too. If you don't want to do that, now you face a like reflective equilibrium problem. You are in a state of disequilibrium. How are you going to resolve that? You've got a couple options. One is accept moral realism. Boom. The disequilibrium is resolved. Um, you, know, you know, in other words, if you, if the, whatever reasons you have for rejecting position A would also apply to reject rejecting position B, you either have to reject both or neither. And, uh, you know, uh, Terence Cuneo would be betting on a lot of people hearing this and going, well, I guess I'll accept both. And I got to accept moral realism. Then. And that's how it's supposed to function. Um, now, you could also say that there's a particular distinctive problem to rejecting epistemic realism in particular, which is that if you try to reject epistemic realism, uh, you would end up in this sort of epistemic realism is to deny that one has epistemic reasons for believing anything, including epistemic anti-realism. And so the position would be self-defeating. You, Why would you believe it if you don't have any reason to believe it? And so because it's self-defeating, you certainly can't even do that. So epistemic realism might have this distinctive sort of self-protective buffer that stops people from rejecting it in particular. And since you can't reject it, if there is parity between moral realism and epistemic uh, realism, and you, you really are not in a position to reject epistemic realism, you're going to have to accept moral realism. You just, there's, you're, you're not going to be able to get out of that. Now, those arguments typically include um, both a claim that epistemic realism is true and a parity premise, which is basically something that is sort of welding moral realism and epistemic realism together. Like uh, if epistemic realism, if, sorry, if moral realism is false, uh, sorry, if moral realism is false, then epistemic realism is false or something like that. Moral realism is not false. So, um, it, I, I mean, I would have, we could just look at Terence Cunha's actual specific argument. Why don't we just do that? I want to see the exact argument. I'm looking for a formalization of the argument. Okay, here's one from Richard Rowland. Give me one second and I'll post this one. I feel like if I post that, it's going to mess up the alignment. Give me a second. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so here's the argument. According to the moral error theory, and yeah, 
I should say, often this is depicted specifically as a, as a type of defensive move against error theory, which holds that all moral first order moral claims are systematically false. And so in a certain sense, it could be regarded as a type of defensive move rather than an offensive move. So it's, it's rebutting certain types of error theoretic accounts more so than it's necessarily making a positive case for realism, although I think you could construe it that way and like go on the offense with this argument if you want to. Okay. One, according to the moral error theory, moral reasons are metaphysically problematic because they're categorically normative. Oh, and this is in fact the example that I gave of why you might be stuck with parity between the two. Um, but it doesn't have to be the only reason. In print, like there could be another reason why you reject moral realism. Okay, anyway, one, according to moral error theory, moral reasons are metaphysically problematic because they're categorically normative. Two, but epistemic reasons are categorically normative. Three, and there are epistemic reasons. Four, so there are categorically normative properties. Five, so moral error theory skepticism about moral reasons and the grounds of moral reasons categorical normativity is, and I think it got cut off, it should be like unwarranted. Let me check the paper. Yep, unwarranted. Uh, it just got, got cut off when I cut and pasted it. So that's roughly the idea, that if you're going to reject one, you got to reject both. Now, you have a couple options here as a if you want to be a moral anti-realist. One is to reject the parity premise. You can just reject that if you reject if you reject one, you have to reject the other. You could say, no, 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 I'm an epistemic realist, and I just deny moral realism. Um, you could you could go that route, and probably some people do. Um, so that's one possibility. That's not the possi That's not the one I go with. So before I ever even knew about arguments like this, I was already a normative anti-realist. I reject all stance-independent epistemic norms, or in this case, you could say um, categorical um, categorical normativity. It's I'm going to reject that too. So. Uh, it's like to the extent that they're even conceptually distinct. So if it's if they're distinct, fine, I reject both. So uh, I already rejected epistemic realism before I ever encountered these. So someone coming to me and saying, ah, but if you, so think about it in my case, I'm an epistemic anti-realist and a moral anti-realist. And the first time I encountered this is someone goes, wait, if you don't reject moral realism, you also have to reject epistemic realism. You wouldn't want to do that, would you? And I, I already do. So this, it's like someone, you know, I've given this example before. It's like, I don't believe in Bigfoot. I don't believe in the Loch Ness Monster. And it's like someone saying, wait, you don't believe in Bigfoot, but then you'd have to not believe in the Loch Ness Monster. Like the cryptozoological evidence for both is, is on par. So if you reject one, you'd have to reject the other. Yeah, I reject both. Not a problem. I don't see it as cost. So one way of avoiding the supposed bullet you'd have to bite uh, from a Companions of Guild argument is to just reject one of the premises that would entail that there's parity between moral and epistemic reasons. The other one is to just reject both moral and epistemic realism. Now, what I specifically deny is that there is, it not only do I deny that there's any bullet biting associated, in, at least in some non-relative way, with rejecting um, moral realism, I also epistemic realism. If someone wants to say that those bite bullets, they're gonna have to convince me that there is a bullet to bite. Like, what are they talking about? Like. Uh, it, I'm, I'm paying a theoretical cost. Theoretical cost is not endorsing a view that I think is completely ridiculous. That's not a cost. That's a, an advantage. I don't think that epistemic realism is remotely plausible. Now, if I thought it were intuitive and I put ev evidential weight on my intuitions, and then I had to override those intuitions in order to accept epistemic anti-realism, I would be paying some cost. I'd be holding a position that from by my own lights was counterintuitive. But I don't consider epistemic realism counterintuitive. I don't consider it plausible. I don't think that there's, it's not just that I don't think that there's a good case for it. I don't think there's a halfway decent case for it. Like, I think it's a very implausible position. I think it's it's not plausible. In fact, I think normative realist accounts are some of the least plausible positions in philosophy, at least as far as I know. Um, was probably I don't know about most positions, but I don't find anything compelling or persuasive or appealing about these positions at all. There's nothing appealing about them. So what bullet am I biting? What's the, what does that even mean? So I'm holding a position that's what? Contrary to what the most current analytic philosophers think? Okay. Yeah, I acknowledge that. Who cares? I don't care. Like, uh, how is, what is that supposed to mean to me? I, I don't particularly, okay, cool. Fine. Then most contemporary analytic philosophers have plausible views. I, or at least think implausible views are intuitive or have some merit, which I don't, I don't even grant that. So uh, I'll get into it more when I talk about the article that I wrote on this. Uh, but yeah, I don't, what's the bullet? If you think I'm biting a bullet, uh, can you explain what that means and why you think I'm biting a bullet? Okay. Uh, so Banner also adds, hello, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. 
uh, Jonas or, or Jonas uh, Jensen says, uh, just joined. What did I miss? Uh, so I talked about my my interest in talking about uh, the psychology of metaethics and doing some videos on that. Um, and also just responding to some some comments. Sandal says, I love liquors. I think it's okay. I, I It's, you know, it's the kind of thing that I, I, it's both the kind of thing that I think people would say it's love or hate. And I don't love it or hate it. It's, it's for me, it's okay. So I think it's not love or hate for everybody. Uh, Alonzo Fife says, are you a realist or anti-realist about pain? As a relevant side comment, I wish people would read Mackie Beyond Chapter 1. Um, yeah, it's going to depend what you mean by pain. So, like, I would be a realist about some characterizations of pain and maybe not about others. I don't believe in phenomenal pain because I don't believe in phenomenal states or qualia. Um, so that would be a, like, a very different from the current issue, although I can see how pain can be tied in with some accounts of ethics. Um, uh, okay, uh, so th that actually has me caught up with with the chat. So let me, unless there's like some problem, let me check. No, th I'm caught up. Cool. That was easy to do. All right. Um, Okay, so I guess I could get into this topic a bit, and I could talk about this. So I've written this article was almost a year ago called um, Philosophers Misused Biting the Bullet as a Rhetorical Move. Um, let me see. Is it super long? No, it's not. Okay, so I'm just going to go through this article. All right, so I'll just read it. Why not? Sometimes I feel like doing that. Okay, here's what I say in that article. I really dislike the way that philosophers will say that a particular position involves biting the bullet. Such a remark is usually attributed to accepting some view that seems to pay some cost or to allow one to sacrifice plausibility for the sake of consistency. But many of the positions I endorse, which I am told involve biting the bullet, don't strike me as biting any bullets at all. They pay no theoretical costs and don't strike me as implausible. Indeed, that's part of the reason I endorse these positions. For instance, I reject uh, if I reject companions and guilt arguments on the grounds that I not only deny that there are stance-independent moral facts, but also stance-independent epistemic facts, I may be told that I am biting the bullet. Uh, it's very relevant to the question that was asked. Supposedly, also rejecting epistemic realism is some huge, implausible, deeply undesirable cost I have to pay to remain consistent. But not only do I deny epistemic realism, I also deny that it is a plausible, desirable, or more sensible position than epistemic anti-realism, and so on. The problem is that philosophers posture as though there is some background agreement on which philosophical positions are more or less plausible or desirable or whatever, and that accepting certain positions is somehow implausible or a concession or a cost, and this requires one to bite the bullet. This is complete nonsense. A person who endorses such views can also reject popular conceptions within the philosophical community about which positions are more or less plausible or desirable or theoretically costly. I think all forms of moral of normative realism are preposterous and obviously so. I would consider it a cost of my views if I did somehow have to accept epistemic realism to be consistent. Far from writing a bullet, I take rejecting epistemic realism to be an instance of spitting them out. I'd see myself as biting a bucket of bullets to even consider epistemic realism. From whose vantage point is my position the untenable one? The epistemic realists? I not only reject epistemic realism, I also reject that it's a plausible position in the first place. Realists are entitled to presume that their positions enjoy greater prima facie appeal. I deny that too. This bullet biting maneuver is often a method of shaming views, not seen as mainstream. It's a means of subtly enforcing conformity to an ostensible orthodox or mainstream philosophical position. And it does so in a way that is reminiscent of poisoning the well. Philosophers whose views hold preeminence within a given field, regardless of whether this is warranted, will cast a broad net, a kind of ambient background of approval and disapproval over a range of potential views, making it clear that the further one moves away from the mainstream orthodox view, the more one's views are radical or revisionary or require one to bite bullets. The implication here is that one should avoid such views, not because of the quality of the arguments for or against them, but merely because they've been discredited by a looming miasma of doubt fabricated by proponents of mainstream views. 
Uh, this is merely well poisoning on a mass scale that consists of preemptively discrediting any deviation from one's own views. Proponents of such views should not only ignore such aspersions, they should object to the framing of their positions as radical or revisionary and object to the claim that they're biting any bullets. So no, I don't think moral anti-realism involves biting any bullets. No, I don't think rejecting epistemic anti-realism involves biting any bullets. And no, I don't think denying phenomenal consciousness exists involves biting any bullets. In all of these cases, I view the mainstream views, which hold these things to be intuitive or obvious or even self-evident, to be predicated on conceptual confusions and errors and to be rooted in many cases in views that seem to have ina uh, inadequately engaged with empirical and scientific findings that I take on reflection to render such views implausible or even unintelligible. For comparison, imagine we still hadn't figured out natural selection. One could imagine academic philosophers generally endorsing creationism and insisting that anyone who proposed a mundane, naturalistic explanation for how life on Earth changed over time and adapted to its environment was biting the bullet and endorsing a radical position. Yet from our vantage point, there's nothing radical or bullet biting about endorsing natural selection as the primary mechanism of evolution. It's not just that natural selection is the best account. It's also that there's nothing radical or especially bullet biting about it. From my point of view, many of the philosophical positions I reject strike me as relying on the premature conclusion that empirical methods are inadequate to resolve or significantly inform and dissolve longstanding philosophical disputes. In the place of such methods, such views often seem to me to rely on dubious methods that are themselves inadequately informed by our best available knowledge of human psychology. These concessions not only strike me as premature, but look to me like viewing the world as a place riddled with mysteries, utterly inaccessible to the sciences. This strikes me as, if not outright magical, pretty damn close. And I don't think I'm biting any bullets or thinking anything radical when I deny the existence of magic. Until philosophers start summoning familiars or rediscover Descartes' horcrux or some, uh, uh, on some dusty shelf in the Vatican, I don't think there's anything radical about denying that there are non-natural properties or realms of platonic objects far beyond the sky. Those of us who endorse views like moral anti-realism should stop conceding that we're biting any bullets, we're not. One may only defensively maintain that others are biting bullets from within the very theoretical frameworks and according to those very epistemic conventions, which we are likewise free to reject. So that's what I wrote. It's not, it's not, it's, I mean, more of a polemic than a sort of sustained argument. Um, but yeah, so I, this idea of biting the bullet, I see it as like you, you can be biting a bullet relative to some set of standards or frameworks or perspectives on the plausibility of a particular position. Uh, but you don't have to accept that those positions are plausible, uh, even if they're in, in, endorsed by a majority of people. Um, well, I'll get to that in a second. So yeah, that's that's what I wrote at the time. I, I do think that this bullet biting stuff is honestly kind of silly. I don't know why, oh, if you hold that view, you're biting the bullet. Who says I'm biting the bullet? How did you establish that? Uh, you know, I might agree, but I feel like that's the sort of thing that should be navigated intersubjectively. And I might agree that I'm biting a bullet with you, but at least in principle, I could also disagree that I'm biting a bullet with you. So if you're making a, a sort of mundane descriptive claim, like you're saying, if someone says, hey, you're biting the bullet and taking that position, if what they mean is you're taking a position that's very non-mainstream, it's like an unconventional view, fair enough. It's a descriptive claim. It could just be true. And it's you know, even if you disagree that the view is implausible, that's not what they're saying. They're just saying, hey, it'd be like if someone said, hey, you have an unconventional view. Well, that could just be true. Uh, if someone says, uh, you have a view that's counter greater elaboration of what they mean. Uh, because what if I find the view intuitive? Like, I don't I don't find moral realis anti-realism remotely counterintuitive. I don't find realism intuitive. So if someone said, oh, well, you're biting a bullet because you have to endorse this counterintuitive claim. Counterintuitive to who? To you? Well, I, yeah. So then you could say, well, you endorse a view that is not intuitive to me. That Imagine that that's what, that, like, in other words, you see how biting the bullet, specify what you mean, and often it comes out to be something that's very unconcerning to the proponent of the view. So I go around endorsing epistemic anti-realism, and someone comes along and says, well, yeah, but if you do that, you're endorsing a view that I don't endorse and I don't find very plausible. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're an epistemic realist and you don't find epistemic realism, anti-realism plausible, I do indeed endorse a view that you disagree with and that you don't find plausible. And like, so what? Uh, so they could say, oh, well, most philosophers disagree with you. Yep. I agree. Most of them disagree with me. 
and like what do I have to agree with what most like is that a cost I mean my, maybe it's some very minimally it's some type of cost because all else being equal if more philosophers endorse something then it's more likely to be true so I'm paying this cost that I'm holding an, an a less that like the view that is not the majority view okay sure I mean how much Bayesian updating do you want me to do I'm not gonna like it's just, it's just that doesn't amount to very much so you know, sometimes people say this as though they think that certain positions we've all just established that certain positions are like intrinsically desirable or others are super implausible. And so you could endorse them, but you have to do extra work. And so if you want to be an epistemic into realist, you have to do all this extra work. Bullshit. I don't think I have to do any extra work. I don't have to do more work than an epistemic realist. Maybe I have to do less. I don't think I have to do more. It doesn't mean I have to do no work. I'm not saying I don't have to say anything to account for epistemic into realism. I'm just saying that I don't presume your position is some sort of intrinsically desirable default position. And that if I want to deviate from it, I'm going to have to give a stronger case that you have to give for it. I don't, I don't grant that. When did you establish that? You didn't want to buy me. So like, I'm not obligated to agree with your conclusions. I'm not, ob I could just not agree. Now what? Uh, so there's just something weird about this. It looks, it looks like social coercion to me. And philosophers shouldn't be doing that. That's that's ridiculous. Okay. So Moonsweater says, can you elaborate some of some on your views on epistemic realism? I don't know how much there is to elaborate on. So epistemic realism. Uh, so I guess here's one thing I could say. Sometimes people will say stuff like, well, if you reject epistemic realism, then you think there are no epistemic norms. This is a common misconception, both about moral realism and epistemic realism and about um, epistemic realist and anti-realist positions more generally. By moral anti-realist, what I take that to mean is that I reject any accounts. I, I mean, technically, <laughs> I don't even just reject all conceptions of moral realism. I have a different views depending on the type of moral realism. The same would hold for epistemic realism. I view any account of moral realism to either um, include irreducible normativity, in which case I consider the position unintelligible, or exclude irreducible normativity, in which case I consider it trivial or false or both. Um, and these claims may include multiple theses, some of which could be false, some of which could be intelligible, uh, sorry, unintelligible, and some of which could be trivial. So these are not mutually exclusive categories, but this is the sort of Lance trilemma. I think all accounts of moral realism are trivial uh, and or false and or unintelligible, depending on the specific contents of the claim. Some people might say, well, it can't be unintelligible and false. Hold up. It could be that the position consists of the conjunction of this claim and this claim and this claim. And it could be that, like, if you take the conjunction as a whole, sure. If I think it's it, a component is unintelligible, maybe the whole thing is unintelligible. But I could say this claim taken in isolation, that claim is unintelligible. But this other claim here, this claim is false. So, for example, and this isn't like speculative. So, um, a, a common way of characterizing moral realism might be um, ordinary people's. Uh, speak as if there are stance independent moral facts or they think that there are more like the ordinary the, the correct account of ordinary moral language uh, involves um the presumption of that there are stance independent moral facts like ordinary moral language purports to describe an objective moral reality i think that claim is false i think it's i don't think that people are trying to do that so that claim is false um and then another claim that there is this stance independent objective you know realm of moral facts that depending on the type of realism if it's non natural realism might be unintelligible uh, and so these are not these categories aren't mutually exclusive because the positions often consist of multiple claims, which you could in principle assess independently of one another. Uh, so that being said, um, why I reject any particular realist account will depend on the realist account. And then some of them are trivial in the sense that um, like I can agree that they're true and it doesn't change my view about what reality is like or what I ought to do. They don't they're not they don't have any sort of a normative authority. They don't tell me what I should or shouldn't do in a way that actually makes any practical difference. Um, Triviality, like what precisely is meant by that? It's a little hard to precisify. I do have a blog post I've been working on. It's kind of a longer one that's more work, so it's more of an essay-ish than like a you know a few paragraphs, where I cover what I have in mind by triviality. But basically, my view is that they're all trivial, false, or unintelligible. This would very likely get imported over to epistemic realism, where I just sit down and think about it. If you're some type of epistemic naturalist and you think that, I mean, effectively, if you think that there are these certain sorts of natural facts that are just descriptions. Uh, of certain normative practices uh, that one could engage in, like certain ways of responding to data or something. And you're just saying, here's a way you could respond to data descriptively. Um, and those are the epistemic facts. Well, if there are 
ways you could respond to the data, then the epistemic facts would correspond to those facts. Um, so there would be epistemic facts. And you could say that there, these are stance, in, like I didn't make them true by preferring them to be the case. And so boom, you've got these stance independent epistemic facts. Done, okay, so epistemic realism is true. Okay, now does that do anything to me? Like, do I have to think in terms, like, uh, no, I could just not use those, those standards. So it would be subject to this triviality concern. Otherwise, it might just be that you failed to describe things accurately, in which case it would be false. Or it could be that you insist on this irreducible epistemic normativity, in which case I would be concerned that the position is unintelligible. Um, now, one common misconception, and this comes up with, with both of the accounts, uh, both of these views, and this is a really silly one, is people will say, okay, well, if you're an epistem, if you're a moral anti-realist, then you don't believe in morality. This is this is just silly. Uh, what do you mean when you say I don't believe in morality? I don't believe in that there are stance, like be specific, right? Be precise. I don't believe that there are stance independent moral facts, but that doesn't mean I don't believe people engage in moral judgment or have moral standards or have moral practices or that there are moral codes that people subscribe to or that different books articulate different moral values that people care about and live their lives according to those standards. Uh, like I believe in all of those things. So when you say I don't believe in morality, well, no, I just don't believe in this particular conception of morality. Um, I talked about this last week, but people make this mistake of thinking that if you don't believe in their particular account of a thing, then you don't believe in the thing. Um, you know, so this would be very weird. It'd be like, you know, if I insisted tables are magical and then I say to you, hey, do you believe in tables? And then you say, yeah. And I'm like, well, do you think the table's magical? And you say no. And I go, okay, well then because tables are magical by definition, then you don't believe in tables. Would, would you accept that? Would you accept that you don't believe in tables because they're not magical? No, you'd say, no, I do believe in tables. I don't agree with you about whether tables are magical or not. Same thing for morality. I do believe in morality. I just don't think morality involves irreducible normativity or stance independence. I just, I don't think, but we can have morality without that. Uh, in fact, I don't think it's even difficult to have it. I think I have it right this very moment. Um, so I, like, I don't have to accept your account of a thing or else I think the thing doesn't exist. Your account of the thing could be wrong. And that's what I think is wrong. Your account is wrong. It doesn't mean you get to take the thing away from me uh, and say that I don't have it. I, so it's something very weird. Uh, do people not understand the distinction? I mean, this is like a clear mistake that people are making, and yet they make it all the time. And so it's not like if you're an epistemic anti-realist um, that you don't believe that there are epistemic norms. Of course, like, does that mean I don't think that there's belief forming practices? Like, of course there are. Do, does that mean I don't think that there are ways of responding to evidence and then or making inferences or uh, trying to have true beliefs? Like none of that occurs, none of that happens. I don't make epistemic judgments. No, of course, I, I, I have views about evidence and, and uh, you know, reasons to believe things. Like I, I have the whole gamut of epistemic practices. I just don't think that they involve irreducible normativity or stance independence. Uh, so there, of course there are epistemic norms and I will tend to employ epistemic norms that tend to be more uh, like truth conducive. Uh, but I just don't think that I have to, even if I didn't want to. I, I Like I typically, I do want to, but what if I didn't? Then I wouldn't, and to that for the the like the, like there aren't facts that mandate I must complain. Like I don't think that that kind of language is sensible. People will say, ah, but the, the epistemic facts are binding. They're binding, binding. If I wanted to show you two things that are like something binding, I could bring like two blocks of wood in here, take some super glue, stick it on them, put them together. Now they're bound. That's binding. Like there, there's actually I could point at it. Uh, if there are these stance independent epistemic facts. Um, as far as I could tell, the way my psychology is constituted, I could tell the facts kindly to fuck off and not employ them. So how the hell am I bound by them? What happens if I don't employ them? Nothing. Nothing happens. So now what? Now what? But if someone wants to say no, if you believe them, you would comply with them. Okay. So are you making claims about my psychology? Prove it. Prove that I believe these things. If you convince me of a thing, that I must comply with it. I mean, are you making a claim about how human brains work? Do all brains have to work that way? Is it constitutive of, of being a, a conscious agent that you necessarily comply? Like, you know, if you want to be a motivational internalist about this, then you could, would either need to, like, you could say, no, it's an analytic fact. I'm just saying that this is what an epistemic um, belief is. It just is something that's motivating. Um, okay, then demonstrate the... Uh, not, I mean, maybe a couple people have run studies on this, but it's, it's not going to be anything very compelling. So that's one thing that people do. So I'll say that you don't you don't have um, epistemic norms if you don't believe. It. So projecting epistemic realism means you reject stance independent 
epistemic norms. It doesn't mean you reject epistemic norms. And to be to be clear, I'm not saying when you ask this that you're assuming anything else. You asked me to elaborate. I'm elaborating. So I'm responding to things that if people have said to me as recently as like yesterday. Um, not kidding about that. I've had some of these discussions yesterday. And they're fun discussions. I got you got a lot of other people having these conversations just fine. But um, part of the problem for this is that the Terence Cuneo formulation of the Companions to Guild argument just drops stance independence. And it's like, it just says, hey, if you don't believe moral facts exist, then you're you you, you know, you, you're going to have to believe that epistemic facts don't exist. But epistemic facts do exist. Well, hold up, hold up. An anti-realist doesn't de not necessarily deny epistemic facts exist. They deny stance-independent epistemic facts exist. And in my case, I only specifically deny that irreducibly normative stance-independent epistemic facts exist. Like, we got to be real specific. So that's a big mouthful. You're like, oh, my God, okay. Oh, oh. Yeah, I'm only specifically denying that there are irreducibly normative and stance-independent moral and epistemic facts. That, that's what I'm specifically denying. If that sounds like a bunch of technical language to you, that's because it is. I'm denying very technical positions that I think philosophers made up. And I don't think this is anything. Like if you're thinking, what's the point of this? What? I don't think there is a point. That what I'm doing is to try to get people to stop wasting time on this stuff because I think this whole idea of irreducible normativity is completely ri ridiculous and empty and pointless. And we need to stop talking about it because it's a massive waste of time. That's why I've sometimes used the term quietism. I think people should basically, this is not, I talk about it in order to, to hopefully convince people to stop talking about it so we can move on to more productive uh, questions in ethics. But until we get past this hang up that so many people seem to have about moral realism, I'm going to have to keep fighting against this because I think it's the ideas are too silly and they need to be, we need to combat them. Uh, and maybe that makes me unpopular with some people that don't like how, uh, Vol like volatile I am towards uh, realism, but too bad. I think I think that there are no good arguments for it. And if people think there are, they're welcome to present some and I'm, I'll explain why I think they're not good arguments. And maybe I'll convince people, maybe I won't. Um, so that's, that's uh, part of it. I guess the self-defeat stuff. Um, so I think that the self-defeat arguments are, I, I, unsurprisingly, what do you think I think? Terrible. They're not very good at all. So I just reject the conditions that they think are the success conditions for having a justification. Uh, like, I don't think in order, to, like a lot of this stuff gets into stuff about, I talk about reasons. And I just think that their accounts of reasons are typically nonsensical. I don't think I need to have stance independent reasons or the kinds of reasons that would be given by stance independent facts. I don't even, I think that talk of facts giving reasons is, it, it sounds metaphorical because it is. I think the metaphor is an empty one. I think it's nonsense. I don't think facts give reasons. I don't think that makes any sense at all. A fact can't give a reason. I just think that's nonsense talk. Um, but the view here might be, look, in order to be justified, in order to have a reason to be an epistemic anti-realist, you would need an, a, a stance independent reason to believe that. And you don't have one. If you deny that there are any, you can't have them if there aren't any. So, um, you know, you can't have a reason to be an, an epistemic anti-realist. I don't agree with their conception of what I need to have beliefs or to be justified. So I don't care about that either. I just reject that too. Um, and I call this the halfway fallacy a lot where um, the proponent of a view will be told, well, you can't hold that view because if you held that view, you wouldn't be able to do this or you, it would be inconsistent with this other thing where you could just say, yeah, but I reject that too. So, and then you don't have a problem. So uh, I could just reject the conditions they think I need to have. And I, again, I don't think that I'm paying a cost because I don't think they've given good arguments for why I would have to think that in the first place. You know, it's not just that I don't think there's good reasons to think that there are stance independent epistemic facts. I also don't think there's any good reason to think that one needs stance independent epistemic facts in order to be justified in having beliefs. Now, you can bake it into your notion of that. You could say, but by justification, we just mean that one has stance independent epistemic facts. Okay, then I'm not justified. I believe it anyway. Now what? What are you? What are, what are you going to do? Tell me I'm not justified? That's trivially true. I mean, that would amount to saying on that view, um, hey. You don't have any stance independent reason to believe that there are no stance independent reasons. I agree. What, what's the objection? I mean, to, to me, I think these, these objections are deeply implausible. And they require the like you, like I, somehow I have an obligation, like I can reject, uh, I can reject realism, but I can't reject that the only sense in which I could reject realism would require appealing to realist principles. Wh why would I agree with that? Did you have a good argument for that? I, I don't think the arguments for that are going to be any more persuasive than the arguments for realism. So why would I agree with that? The answer is I wouldn't. And I shouldn't, given my standards about these sorts of things. And I haven't 
had anybody convincingly show that my standards are misguided or false or mistaken or inconsistent. And so I think at the very least I'm endorsing but he convincingly showed me that the position is inconsistent. So that's some stuff I could say about epistemic realism. All right. Do you think stuff like abstract objects are similarly unintelligible as stance independent moral facts? Not necessarily. I don't know that I have a huge problem with abstract objects. Um, I, I think that sometimes people think that I'm just being an inconsistent skeptic and that I'm being extra skeptical of moral talk and epistemic talk, and I guess you could say normative talk in general, but not other talk. I don't think so. I, I don't have huge problems with, I, I mean, I'm not going to go in for a lot of metaphysics, but um, I, I don't think that you have to go, be like super skeptical of all of metaphysics to share with me my skepticism towards normative realism in particular. I think normative realism is uniquely weird in terms of how deeply implausible it is and how mysterious and bizarre and how the proponents of it are, are stuck in this constant situation where they either have to try to naturalize it and it ends up losing its special properties. It's sort of, you know, what Mackie might call objective prescriptivity, um, but people have called practical uh, um for clout or, or, or authority. Some of these don't have to be the same things as one another, but it's supposed to, to move us, to, to guide us, to bind us. People use various sorts of language. Often that language is metaphorical, and I think it's metaphorical for a reason. When you can't clearly articulate what you mean, often you rely on metaphors. In some case, in some cases, it makes sense to say a metaphor for what? For what exactly? And I don't think realists can tell us. So I think that idea that there are these certain sorts of facts that we like must or we should, like we it's it's normative, like you ought to do it. And then if I, you know, if I ask, what do you mean by ought? You can't tell me. Well, I think we've got a problem there. Um, so, and that's something that uh, might be worth talking about, um, some of that. So uh, let me see if, okay, nope, nobody uh, there. So um, let me ask in the chat, does anyone have any extra questions about all this stuff? So biting the bullet, um, if you disagree and you want to leave a comment, I'd be happy to read that comment. Just be respectful and polite. Uh, if you say a bunch of nasty stuff, I'm not going to post it. If you have questions for me that are related to the topics I'm talking about, um, please uh, throw those in the chat now. Uh, so basically, I'm going to do a final call for uh, reading comments and um, asking questions. And uh, then I'm going to take a quick break. I'm going to come back and then see if there's anything else I feel like talking about today. Um, and all right, so let's do that. And I will be back in a minute. I'm going to I'm going to get some um, uh, like like music to play. What's it called? An intermission music. Uh, for for the future, I know I, I eventually got those intro and outro videos, but I'm gonna have to get some some new stuff to to spruce up the channel a bit. Okay, I'll be back in a couple minutes.
Okay, I am back. So let's see. All right. So um, Jonas Jensen says, if and when metaethics is left in the bin, what kind of philosophical process would we argue normative ethics? So this is something that I've just addressed a couple times in this channel, but not not very often. Um, so I see a lot of negotiation. So if you abandon the idea that there's some sort of standards out there, independent of our goals and values that we ought to comply with, independent, you know, again, like there's like there's a there's a rule list out there. We got to figure out what's on the rule list, and then we got to follow the rules. That to me is the realist framework. Um, I don't see why we'd do that because let's say we find that list for me, either the things on the list would tell me to do things that I already wanted to do anyway, in which case it's redundant. I'm already going to do them or it would tell me to do things that I don't want to do, in which case I won't do them. And I'm not even sure I could do them. My own view of psychology basically is that agents basically carry out or execute their goals or their desires. And it like voluntary action more or less just is action that is goal-directed. It's goal-directed action. You act in accordance with your goals. Of course, there's involuntary action, the reflexes and that sort of thing. Um, or, you know, some, you know, you could, there could be like a compulsion, like mind control or something like that. But so long as you're voluntarily carrying out actions, you're acting in accordance with your goals. Um, and so if there's a moral fact, and, uh, you know, this is why, you know, if someone says the moral facts are necessarily motivating, fair enough, we could start talking about that. But then we're going to have to ask the question, of whether human brains or the brains of agents just necessarily are constituted in a certain way or as a contingent matter about human brains, if they're constituted in such a way that, or if they believe something, they're necessarily motivated. That's a that, that's an empirical question, whether we in fact have brains constituted that way. Because, you know, someone could say, okay, no, 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 this is, an, this is an analytic claim. I'm claiming that for something to be a moral belief just is for it to necessarily be motivating. Fine. You could say that it's an analytic claim. Fine. Not an empirical claim. You're just saying you're stipulating that that is what a, a, you don't even have to be stipulating. You say analytically, I figured this out. Okay, then it's possible that human psychology is structured in such a way where we don't have any necessarily motivating beliefs. In which case, then nobody has moral beliefs. So then, too bad. So you could say, ah, uh, all moral beliefs are necessarily motivating. Okay, then no humans have moral beliefs because we're not psychologically constituted that way. If you're going to be talking about humans, like humans. You're going to have to deal with empirical questions at some point if you're dealing with the motivation. It's not avoidable. So uh, that that's going to be um, you know one sort of issue. Uh, if they want to be externalists about it, so we you know we have this list of rules. If it has things on it that um, I don't want to do, then as far as I can tell, I just won't do them, and I'm not sure I could do them because I I only do what I want to, and I don't want to do those things, so I won't do them. Now, if you want to say they're necessarily motivating, maybe I'm I'll be compelled, in which case. Again, I'm not sure that we need to say that I should because I just will. So what is the should adding? Like if there's a list of rules where if I read the list and I believe what's on the list, I will do what's on the list. Why do you need to say I should do it? I, I am doing it. What, you know? So then that's an issue. And then let's just say they're an externalist, which I think probably most realists are. I'd have to check the data on that. Um, okay. So um, I don't have to do it. Like I'm not compelled to do it and I don't want to do it. And so it's this thing there, you know, on the list. I'm not automatically compelled. Uh, okay, then no, no thanks. If if the moral facts don't align with what I want to do, and I'm not some sort of of agentic puppet that will necessarily conform with them, then no thank you. I don't want to. So if the moral facts are stuff like screaming tables all days all day uh, and never drink water, only drink you know Gatorade or whatever, uh, I'll pass. And like as far as I can tell, okay. So let's say there are these moral facts, um, and I don't comply with them. What happens? Does, does the universe, does the fabric of space and time tear open and swallow us all? No, nothing happens. There's no consequences. So if you don't want to do it, just don't. So like to hell with the moral facts. I don't care about them. So setting aside all that. So we throw it in the garbage bin, which is totally where it belongs. Just it, in fact, it doesn't even deserve to be in the garbage bin. We need to incinerate it. Just get rid of uh, moral realism as an idea. It's a bad idea. Uh, okay. So we got rid of moral realism. Um, it's not even left in the bin anymore. <clears throat> what do we do now? Okay, well, think about scenarios like this. You and a group of friends, um, you're sitting around, you feel like ordering pizzas. When you go about trying to figure out, you know, let's say there's 10 of you um, and you want to order pizza. Are you trying to figure out what like the correct pizza toppings to get are? Like how many pizzas? What? Let's say you, you agree, there's 10 of you, you're going to get five pizzas. I don't know if that's reasonable or not. Um, 
you're going to get five pizzas. Are you like doing math? Ah, oh, okay. Well, one of them has got to be mushroom. And you know, no, you start talking about what you want and then you negotiate. Like, what's the thing that like, well, if one person's allergic to olives, then maybe you don't get any olives on the pizzas. Or if you do maybe just one for the people that like, if another person's like, I love olives, I gotta have olives. Um, they give that person the, the olive pizza, but maybe don't put olives on all the pizzas. Cause then that one person that's allergic, isn't going to be able to, to eat any of them. And you don't want to be a jerk to your friend that has an allergy. Um, if you have vegans, then maybe you are going to minimize how much meat you're adding to the pizza. You might need a, like vegan cheese. So you're going to have all these questions where what you're doing is navigating what people want. And so morality can just be that at, at, a, at a larger scale, you know, at, at with greater stakes than uh, figuring out what to put on pizza. So, you know, navigate what you want. What kind of society do you want to live in? Well, I don't want to live in a society where people murder one another. Do you? No? Great. Let's make a rule against murder. Okay. Well, most of us want rules against murder. We have the rules against murder. They're currently in place. They seem to be working. Eh, maybe not so great, but um, you know, maybe they could be working better, but whatever. We have rules against murder, at least on paper. Um, and then a person comes along and says, okay, well, you know, there's no objective moral facts and I want, you know, murder. So that person goes around saying that. Um, well, tough shit. No. And then they say, oh, but there's no fact that, that, says that, you know, you're any more right than me. You're anti-realists. My moral opinions are just as valid as yours. Yeah, no, they're not. Who cares? I don't care. Uh, I mean, they're equally, by valid, what do you mean? They're equally true? Like, yeah, you have your values. I have mine. I don't care about your values. I don't want them to be imposed on society. So, no. So, like, basically, I think we're already doing this. I don't think we need realism to navigate, like, rules about, like, hey, there should be stop signs. There should be speed limits. We should have rules against murder and stealing. All of this stuff can be navigated without proposing that there are any stance independent moral facts. I don't think people are doing that anyway. So what would we do? I think we would basically do what we're already doing, which is appeal to shared and intersubjective values of most people. And if most people happen to be awful, that's unfortunate if you don't have stance independent epistemic facts. Um, too bad. Like, I, like that. if that's how reality is, that's how reality is. I mean... If it makes it, like, if you really, really have values that you want to impose on everybody else or get people to agree with, and they would be more likely to agree with them, if you argue that realism is true, maybe there's prudential reason to lie or try to deceive people. I could see that, but it's not going to make it true. And if we encounter practical problems from rejecting realism, uh, if they are significant enough, maybe that would be a reason for me to be some type of fictionalist or to start lying and saying I'm a realist. Do keep in mind that wouldn't make realism true. It would just make realism useful, you know, like a or it wouldn't even make realism useful. It would make belief in realism useful. Uh, so it might, and that could even just be a feature of humans. Maybe there's some, you know, non-human species where they don't need realism and they're like, ah, the primitive humans need to have this mystical belief in facts telling them what to do. They need the list of stuff that's outside of themselves. Uh, but okay. So let's say we don't have that. Okay. I think things are fine. I don't think there's any problems. Um, I, I know you're not suggesting explicitly that there's problems, but sometimes people will, will seem to think that if you got rid of realism, like all hell would break loose. It would be chaos. We wouldn't know what to do. People would just start stabbing one another. I don't think any of that would happen. I don't think there's any bad consequences to rejecting realism. Keep in mind, I don't think most people are realists to begin with. And so I don't think you need a specifically anti-realist conception of normative ethics to do normative ethics. You could just do normative ethics. So, uh, or just have institutions, have normative principles and rules, you know, whatever ones you want. Uh, and it, people seem to think that that would be chaos and cat catastrophic. I think it more or less describes how it already is. I, I, I mean, is, is it kind of chaotic and a little catastrophic? Yeah, could be better. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be better by being realists, at least not much better. And I don't know that the costs of trying to convince everybody of realism would be worth it. I don't know what that would do. Uh, you know, the thing about realism is it's not like if you're a realist that everybody is going to believe what you believe the realist facts are. They're going to believe what they believe the realist facts are. Uh, and so uh, with whatever, like, look, if we went through history, do you think most of the people that did horrible things in history were anti-realists about morality? I don't think so. I think either they had no determined position or if they, they could have been realists. Someone could be a realist and think, killing all these people is great or something like that. So there's nothing inconsistent between being a moral realist and having awful normative moral views. I don't think it give, lends much of an edge to normative ethics 
and and like basically the practical questions that we engage in. So, I mean, this is a, this is another reason I don't think anti-realism bites any bullets. I don't think it carries the kinds of terrible consequences for practical theorizing and normative ethics and all these other sorts of things that I think moral anti-realists, sorry, moral realists often seem to think that it does or suggest that it does or imply that it does. I just don't think it carries these negative consequences. Okay, uh, that looks like the last question. I see no reason to carry on forever and ever. An hour and a half is good enough. So I think I'll wrap it up there. Um, I, I feel like I could keep going, but ah, I think I'm good for today. All right, uh, so thanks so much everybody for being here. And uh, I will see you all I, next week. I know I'm taking a break pretty soon, um, but I, I've been at this for a while. But uh, yeah, whatever. I'll see you all next week and take care. And please leave comments. Um, check out that um, the video I did on the, the Duke channel. It's called uh, Duke Debates. Um, so check that out because it's an interview where I talk uh, more about my dissertation research. Um, and again, I will be getting into more of some of that research where I go into more detail, and that'll be probably individual episodes. I'll either throw that in the stream or do it in the middle of the week or something. So we'll see how how I end up doing that. You know, and like, subscribe, comments, you know, all that stuff. Um, join the Discord. Uh, check the description because in the description I have ways that you can support the channel and all that good stuff. So yeah. All right. So I guess I'll see everybody uh, next week. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for everybody being here, and I'll see y'all later. Take care.